I'm trying to do my part to curb global warming. Now, for a garage inventor like me, that's not an easy thing to do when you're dealing with something that's so grandiose in scale as a solar vortex generator. So for me to get it out to the market in normal channels means I would get eaten alive, in other words, by a large corporation, uh, because of the money that could come from this, and um, that's not my intent. So what I can do here is I'm not going to promise that I have a whole new form of alternative energy, but it looks pretty good, and that's my job is to convince you of that. And uh, so after you're done watching this video, I hope to have you scratching your head as to whether or not this thing deserves further research. And that's all I can do. And so your part is, if you think it does have potential, then click that share button, because that's the only way I can get this thing under the likes of somebody like Bill Gates. So all you really need to generate clean, pure, carbon-free energy 24-7 is air, water, the sun, and a computer. That's it. Check this out. Here's a perfect example of what's going on inside of a solar vortex generator. This is a, called a vortex fountain. Now if I turn this on, and you see the vortex happening, if I stop this, at right about the 10 second mark, let's say right about here, and then I take this funnel, standard funnel, and I slipped it up underneath here, and I put it up so it encapsulates that vortex, you now have an idea of what's going on inside of a solar vortex generator. By introducing water angularly into the side of this funnel, you can see how easily a vortex can be created. If I increase or decrease the flow of water, up here, you can see I increase the thickness of the vortex, which is a mechanism I'm going to discuss later. That open space in here allows me to put in a structure that neither is going to affect the vortex or is it going to be affected by it. Now let's take this simulated turbine here and let's immerse that into the vortex and you can see how easily that energy could be created. Well, imagine that we're not using water but air instead and the funnel is turned upside down. Water is 784 times more dense than air and although air is not a liquid, both air and water follow the same principles of fluid dynamics. Let's use this as an example of a windmill turbine. Now these blades are about 120 feet across which makes this diameter almost 250 feet. These things are pretty big. Now these blades on an actual wind turbine are very high tech. They actually have an airfoil design to them so besides deflection moving this aside it also adds to the airplane wing effect adds to the efficiency. But the highest efficiency that you can possibly get with a windmill turbine is 59.3 percent. It's called Betz's Limit. So now what if we made a complete change to the design of the propeller, a radical change to something so simple as a paddle with a slight curvature to it and an extension. Now what if I told you that I could take man-made air and hit, take that 100% of that man-made air, hit 100% of this surface area 100% of the time. And because it's riding in a vortex, like so, there's no turbulence and can go on to turn multiple generators, let's say five more generators. Well, you probably think, I'm blowing a whole lot of hot air, and you'd be exactly right. Heat is generated by a large clamshell-shaped greenhouse called a solar collector. As the heated air rises by convection, the wind created makes a dramatic change in direction. 
The vortex actuators are curved specifically to cause the heated air to be channeled into the base of a cone, kind of like a baseball pitcher throwing an underhanded curveball upwards. Each portal created by the actuators delivers a combined amount of rising heated air to initiate a vortex. The cone shape continues that vortex upwards. There are 16 portals on this prototype with each arc being 22 and a half degrees. Here's what it looks like without the cone on, just the shroud is on, that's it. And um, I've got the front end open here. The rest of these are blocked off, you can see in the back side here. Now you see there's no real direction. Until you put that cone on there, it makes all the difference. The way this works is you can have all the same size generators going up if you wanted to but then you would have to increase the size of this to compensate for that distance there and loss of leverage. As the vortex of air inside the cone rises, it impacts all three blades of each turbine equally and perpendicularly and continues on to turn multiple turbines until all of the thoroughly spent air is delivered to the chimney. Man-made high-velocity wind exceeding 30 miles an hour has already been proven but is not needed as much as steady, dependable wind created from steady, dependable sunshine. And odds are pretty good that that's going to happen in a desert. For the SVG to work day and night, it is imperative that the skin of the cone is heat retentive. There are two ways to increase the speed of the rising hot air. Number one is the angle of slope or inclination. So the more inclined it is, the faster that air is going to rise up to the center. Now, the faster it gets drawn out is the reason for the chimney. The taller the chimney is, the faster the pull effect. So all of this has to be balanced together, the amount of push balanced against the amount of pull. On June 21st, the peak of the summer solstice, the sun is going to start here on the other side, north of east. The sun's going to come up over here and it's going to be a direct hit on this surface area the whole time. And that's the reason for the clamshell shape. So when this starts out, the sun rises in the east, actually north of east in June, it's going to hit this area where the inclination is the greatest. And that's because the sun, when it rises, it's going through so much atmosphere that it's not as intense of light. So that's the reason why we want it steeper here so the angle is more direct and the inclination is higher so that the, the heated air will rise even faster. Now as the sun moves around and it follows its arc, the clamshell shape is designed to gather as much of the sun's energy as is possible. So this design here was geared for the 27th parallel north and south of the equator. In other words, that's going to take in southwestern deserts and central Australia two real hot spots, and that's where this would be intended to be used, primarily in a desert where it's hot. What we want to try and do is create as much of a temperature difference between the inside of the greenhouse and the air outside, because the more we can create that difference in temperature, the faster the air is going to move. It's called buoyancy effect. So we want it really hot inside, as hot as we can get there. So there's two ways to do that. You can have a lot of surface area, uh, to a surface area volume ratio, in other words, where we want all kinds of surface, but not a whole lot of volume underneath. And the second way is to have a dark surface underneath. So that's almost like a black asphalt color that we're gonna have, because that's really gonna absorb a lot of sunlight. So based on my research, it's going to get about 190 degrees in here. By the time the air enters there at maybe 90 degrees, by the time it gets here, it will be around 190 degrees. And it's going to be rising all the way, drawn up by the chimney and the angle of inclination. Since the north side of a greenhouse really serves no function, why put something there? So that's the reason for the back side of the solar vortex generator is the shape that it is. 
This part's all cut out. It's basically one quarter of the entire circle. So this is where uh, there will be a portal of entry here that'll go up and then a person can gain access up into the Vortex Arena area through an opening here and that's where they can do repairs on the generators. The uh, generators inside here can lower up and down into those areas. So you're working on a, a central platform to do all the repair work. To give you an idea of a size relationship, that cone right there, the base of it, if it was the diameter of a regular windmill turbine, it would be 250 feet across, and that distance from the front there all the way to this front edge would be a quarter of a mile. So this uh, solar vortex generator is not a small item. There is an iris that sits up here that opens and closes in conjunction with the flapper valves here so that it can balance the system so it optimizes efficiency both day and night. As the sun rises in the east it's going to start warming up this part of the vortex generator. These portals are going to be open. The computer software is going to control that. So we have free air coming in here. The rest of these portals are going to be closed off because they're not doing anything and you don't want to lose the back pressure. So as the sun continues its arc over the top of the clamshell shape, it's going to be opening these portals as they are needed and closing these that are not being affected anymore. And all of that is going to be balanced with the iris at the top. And that's how you control maximum efficiency of the solar vortex generator. To operate the solar vortex generator at night, you need to store as much heat energy as possible during the daytime. This requires a different style of low volume, high surface area greenhouse that will get you to over 200 degrees in the daytime. The combined amount of water contained in the bladders during the day matches the holding volume of a heavily insulated tank buried under the hill of the solar collector. These constrictor bands are located at various areas and a distance apart on all of the bladders. And what these do is they ensure that there's going to be a high point between the constrictor bands. This is where a bubble is going to form. And this is what the float ball check valve is designed to do. It gets rid of that air bubble to ensure that the internal surface of the bladder is in full contact with the water inside to ensure that there's a full amount of heat transfer from the solar energy. These are inlet and outlet valves that are located on each one of the bladders. So at a certain time of night, after all the heat energy has been given up by the thermal mass of the asphalt, and that water gets pumped inside of a storage tank that's heavily insulated and buried inside of this hill. Now that water gets pumped in through these radiators. It's kind of like baseboard heating that you see in your homes. And at some time in the morning, after all of that heat energy is released, it's now pumped back into the storage system through the other line and then the bladders become inflated, the air bubble occurs, gets rid of the air bubble, the sun comes up and the whole system recycles itself again. Winds blowing into the entry portals, if allowed, could create rogue vortices. Basically, many tornadoes that can wreak havoc with internal structure. This is one of two reasons for building subterranean. Winds simply blow over the top. The other reason is low construction cost. To build the SVG, you would excavate a large clamshell shape in a pre-selected area of desert out of sight. In the middle of that is constructed a very large insulated tank that can accommodate a very large volume of water, kind of like a gigantic thermos bottle. The sand simply gets backfilled around and over the tank to create the slope of the SVG. Sand would be a problem all around the solar vortex generator, so there's going to be a whole perimeter of a type of snow fence. I couldn't find anything that I liked on the internet or anything on the market so I invented something that I call a blowing sand arrester and they'll be positioned around the entire perimeter of the SVG. 
This is what could be called a blowing sand or snow arrester. This is a prototype. It's not necessarily materials I'm going to be using. But anyway, this is uh, pieces of half inch angle iron. And um, this is a scale model. And here's what's going on is the sand as a saltation occurs or the blowing sand occurs, it hits this side. And this 45 degree angle splits it into two parts where this angle is reversed on the back side so it has a pocket to catch that sand as it's deflected in either direction. So the fact that it's at an angle like this means the sand's going to come in here, it'll get caught in this pocket and it'll be driven down so it settles around here. After a period of time the snow and sand and such is going to collect around the arrestor area. So the way you get rid of that is just a plow comes through here, removes the sand or snow, so it can be redistributed to another location. Then this is picked up, probably by down here, flipped over, and then this sand can be removed and to rebuild another area. And then this is pushed back over again, so it can be used to recollect a new batch of sand or snow. Over the past eight years, while this has been in storage, not a day has gone by that I haven't wondered about the potential for the solar vortex generator to, to create clean, pure, carbon-free electrical energy. But how does one go about convincing people when you've only got part of a prototype? Um, so for this reason, I had to learn how to do video editing so I could make this hopefully convincing argument. So, and if uh, it is convincing, then I can move on to phase one where I can finish what I started in a desert. Now, there are thousands of square miles of desert west of the Rocky Mountains where nobody ever goes, but maybe it's a place where tourists can go to get a closer look at the SVG. If things look good, then I can move on to phase two where I build a unit the size of a house. That will give me a whole lot of um, information and an increase in size will benefit sound research. And that's when I can get uh, scientists and engineers involved and learn construction methods, uh, where to put the sensors to glean as much information, how to build the software to determine the control mechanisms, um, increase the chimney height and size, uh, the length of the solar collector, things like that. And all that data can provide trend lines and that will say or determine what's going to happen at full potential. And then if it all looks good, then I can move on to phase three where the public can maybe invest in a full scale solar vortex generator and we can all share in the uh, low cost carbon free electrical energy that comes from it. Here's one more thing is that since a huge volume of air passes through the solar vortex generator and that air comes in contact with a lot of surface area and that air is uh, heated and which makes it highly reactive then it's more susceptible to chemical extraction of the CO2 and maybe even clean out pollutants as well. So I have high hopes for it. I hope you believe in it. Thank you for watching.